So to kick us off today, we're going to start with a speaker who I actually met on my road to the London Family Planning Summit. Her name is Kathleen Cavney. And I invited her to come speak at the foundation with a small group of us over a year ago because I wanted to learn more about my own Catholic faith, learn about its doctrine, and why we got to where we did on contraceptives. And Kathleen is both a scholar, a theologian, and a scholar of the law at Notre Dame. And I knew she was the right person to help educate us when she started the meeting with a quote from St. Augustine's City of God. And I think what you'll learn from Kathleen today is that there are ways to search and to question inside of a religion. And some of that searching for meanings and bringing things up to date is what will change societies at large. So I welcome to the stage now, Kathleen. The HIV AIDS pandemic is a public health crisis. According to the latest global fact sheet from UNAIDS, approximately 2.5 million people became newly infected with the HIV virus in the year 2011. An, an, an estimated 1.7 million people died of AIDS-related causes in that same year. There are signs of improvement. 2011 also witnessed a significant decrease in the number of new infections in many countries. And globally, there were 24% fewer deaths than there were in 2005 from the AIDS virus. But there's still a long way to go. For religious believers, the HIV AIDS pandemic is also a crisis of faith. Why do good people suffer? That is a question that has been asked since ancient times, and you can see that if you read the book of Job. There is no fully satisfactory answer to the question, but there are some bad ones. Somehow, these people don't matter. Somehow, God hates them. No. Christians cannot accept these answers. God does not punish people who are afflicted with HIV AIDS. God stands in solidarity with them as they suffer, just like good mothers and fathers everywhere stand in solidarity with their suffering children. The task of those who follow Jesus, the one who taught us to call God Abba, which means dad or daddy, is to do the same. We are all called to be good Samaritans. Can religious believers positively disrupt the HIV AIDS crisis? Many people are skeptical. They say that religious belief serves only to entrench unjust social practices in the name of preserving tradition and promoting order. They think that the Roman Catholic tradition, to which I belong, subjugates women and hardens people's hearts against those who are suffering from sexually transmitted diseases. But there is another side to the story, a side that demands compassion and creates space for positive development and change. The most positively disruptive words in the entire New Testament come in the verses that are commonly known as Mary's Magnificat. These words are spoken by a very young and vulnerable girl to a very old and fragile woman, but they are filled with confidence. Marveling at how God has chosen her to be the mother of Jesus, Despite her youth and poverty, Mary goes and pays a visit to her cousin Elizabeth, who has now found herself miraculously pregnant at a great age with John the Baptist. Mary proclaims God's special concern for those who suffer unjustly at the hands of the powerful and of the ruthless. She says, God has shown strength with his arm, he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has 
brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Now, over the centuries, many bishops and theologians have attempted to drain the transformative power of these words by interpreting them in exclusively spiritual terms, saying they have no relevance for our earthly life. But that approach doesn't do justice to the biblical text. Mary is here drawing upon words and images from the Hebrew Bible. Words and images that proclaim God's care and concern for all of his people in this life, in the here and now. What would happen if we take Mary's words as applying to our lives in the here and now? Well, it seems to me we would have a biblical mandate for positive disruption. I'd like to suggest that in a religious framework, positive disruption can be understood as shattering existing patterns of action and interaction in order to replace them with better patterns, patterns that are truer and more life-giving. In the broad Christian tradition, believers act as positive disruptors when we challenge ourselves and our communities to recognize each human being as equal in dignity because they are made in the image and likeness of God. They disrupt or break apart structures that demean and degrade people in order to posit or establish structures that are life-giving and that lift them up. The Baptist minister Martin Luther King Jr positively disrupted the racist regime of Jim Crow laws with the civil rights movement. Together with other religious leaders, he decried the structural poverty that prevented African Americans from meeting the basic needs of themselves and their families. He combated the racist structures that manipulated and coerced them. But he also did something else. He envisioned a redeemed community, a reconciled community, in which all Americans could contribute to the common good with the gifts and talents they have, no matter what the color of their skin. So we see that religious believers can positively disrupt the communities to which they belong. But we need to ask ourselves a harder question. Can religious believers positively disrupt themselves? Can we call our own traditions to account? I think we can. The great jurist and historian John T. Noonan Jr. has shown how Catholic teaching has developed over the centuries. What was forbidden, usury defined as lending money at interest, became permissible. What was permissible, buying and selling human beings as slaves, became forbidden, as an intrinsic evil, actually. What was prohibited, the state's in principle recognition of the right of every person to religious liberty, became required. Now, Roman Catholic theologians tend to talk about this as if it's development of doctrine. But development is far too mild a word for what's going on here. It is, in fact, a disruption. In fact, in some examples, you can see something that approaches a 180-degree reversal of course. In the medieval and early modern period, for example, uh, many theologians vigorously defended the duty of the church to work in concert with the state to detect, persecute, and punish heretics, sometimes with gruesome executions. In contrast, 50 years ago at the Second Vatican Council, the Roman Catholic Church proclaimed that everyone has a right to religious liberty which the state has a corresponding duty to protect and to promote. 
Catholics used their deepest and truest commitments to critique and upend even long-standing aspects of their tradition and doctrine. Catholics began asking themselves whether owning slaves and burning heretics was truly consistent with respecting each and every person as made in the image and likeness of God. And the answer to that question was a resounding no. It was arrived at slowly and painfully over the centuries, but it was no. And so we re reset our course to our true north, to loving our neighbor as Jesus loved us. Even today, you can find examples of Catholics positively disrupting their communities, um, both where they live and around the globe. I'd like to tell you about the work of the All Africa Conference, Sister to Sister. In March 2002, a number of women theologians from Africa met at Yale Divinity School in order to examine the devastation, in fact, the disproportionate devastation that HIV AIDS was um, inflicting upon their continent and particularly on women and children. As a result of that meeting, some American Sisters of Mercy founded the All Africa Conference, Sister to Sister, in order to facilitate the mutual empowerment of African women. Over the past decade, more than 1,000 nuns from 21 African countries have participated in three regional and nine national conferences in order to learn more about how AIDS and HIV um, uh, works and, and, and devastates people and to develop strategies for addressing its, uh, its devastation in their own communities. These conferences have delivered uh, decisive results as two Uganda-based pro uh, programs show. A counseling training program for sisters has equipped over 100 nuns to positively disrupt the terror that misinformation and taboo about HIV AIDS is inflicting upon their communities a program for transformative spiritual leadership and faith de development is positively disrupting the system of degradation that prevents many African women religious from obtaining the education and the empowerment that they deserve. The American nuns, for their part, do not see themselves as proposing a particular policy to the African nuns, much less as imposing one. Their goal is to facilitate and to support the creative and energetic and wise response of the African sisters themselves to their own problems. As one American sister of mercy said, these women are so strong, but they have no resources and patriarchy is alive and well in their cultures. So the Roman Catholic tradition, as I'm sure many of you know, is hierarchical. And it is the hierarchy that determines official Catholic teaching on particular issues. So I'd like to shift the focus away from the sisters in Africa now and move to Rome, so to speak, and ask whether there are any signs that the HIV AIDS crisis is positively disrupting Catholic teaching. I think there are. Now, as many of you may also know, official Catholic teaching prohibits the use of condoms in order to serve as a contraceptive to prevent conception. But can they function? Can they be legitimately used in order to prevent disease? And here I think we're seeing some signs of new thinking. In the year 2010, Pope Benedict XVI said that it would be a first step toward the assumption of moral responsibility for a male prostitute to use, uh, to use a condom in, 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 in sexual activity. 
a few conservative theologians would go even further. An Opus Dei priest who's a moralist said that it would be morally permissible for a, a married man who is uh, infected with HIV to use a condom to prevent infecting his wife, despite the fact that that condom would also prevent conception. Steps. I myself would go even further. In the Catholic tradition, an act of sexual intercourse between a husband and wife is meant to be an act of love. To knowingly infect one's spouse with a devastating deadly disease is not an act of love. Moreover, exposing anyone to the HIV uh, AIDS virus, no matter what their status, no matter what your relationship, gay or straight, married or single, prostitute, lover or spouse, violates the most basic requirements we have to respect one another as a child of God. We are all God's beloved children. We all have equal dignity. This fundamental truth can challenge and disrupt even the most settled moral teachings. Francis, our brand new pope, just a couple of weeks old, has washed and kissed the feet of intravenous drug users, people who are suffering from HIV AIDS, and mothers and their babies. Now that that, to me, is a sign of positive disruption. That is a signal of what it might mean to love one another as God has loved us. So I have hope about this. Thank you. Kathleen, you talk so eloquently about um, the church and changes that it's made over time. You made me incredibly hopeful as we went into this whole conversation about contraceptives. But as a woman, I mean, we go into these, as you said, African countries and various places mm -hmm. where women still don't have much power. But that's true in the Catholic Church as well. Mm -hmm. How do you think about that as you think about the power structure inside of the Catholic Church and the fact that we need to elevate women's voices in these conversations? Well, I think it's a challenge. I, I think that what we have to do is keep speaking, keep speaking out, and I think that women in, in, in the West have a particular responsibility to make our, our voices and our opinions on these things heard, and also to reach out to members of the hierarchy who, you know, who may not have um, you know, wives, but, but do have sisters and nieces, and, and try to make it personal and say, well, what about your niece? What about your, what about your sister? How do you think about them? And then expand out to the human family from there. Mm. I was amazed uh, to see the coverage of the new pope in the last few weeks, the, the continued mm. coverage, and, and so much what seems like hopefulness. Mm -hmm. His message about, which is a part of my Catholic face, about the social justice exactly. teachings in the Catholic religion are so beautiful. What makes you hopeful about him? Well, what makes me hopeful about him is, I think, two things. Um, one is, I think he recognizes that doctrine is one thing, but we're not going to be judged by what we write in our little catechism notebooks. We're going to be judged by how we treat other people. And so he's leading by example, showing us how to live simply, how to care for the earth, and how to treat one another. That's one thing that makes me hopeful. The other thing that makes me hopeful, honestly, is he's a Jesuit. Mm -hmm. And the Jesuit tradition, uh, is, is, is long and deeply uh, intellectual and absolutely fearless. They're deeply committed to God, but they recognize that sometimes this means uh, breaking uh, new directions and uh, treading into waters that are uncharted. As I said to Kathleen last night, one of my favorite priests, uh, when I was growing up in high school, uh, the girls, we had to go take our calculus and physics classes over at Jesuit, our brother's <laughs> school, because they weren't offered at my school. And so one of my favorite teachers in life was my physics teacher, who was an incredible Jesuit, not just in physics, but in terms of what religion he taught me. So thank you for sharing thank your ideas you, with us today. Appreciate okay. it.